Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you for joining us today. You need to park right here. You will not, but we're going to do a two-part show today. And my special guest, Dr. Hugh Ross, and then my other guest I'm going to keep as a surprise. So that will be revealed to you right after you see one of the most amazing DVDs. This is just a clip. You need the entire DVD that I watched. Take a look at this. I was taught uh, in, in physics was that darkness is not a substance. It's simply the absence of light. But notice in Job, God is saying that darkness is real. It's a substance. Today, we know Job got it right. We know that the universe is not simply the absence of light. Darkness is actually a substance. In fact, 99.73% of the universe is dark stuff. And now we know that it has three different forms, dark energy, exotic dark matter, and ordinary dark matter. We also know that the quantities of the three different kinds of darkness are the most fine-tuned things we can measure in all creation. If you were to ask me as a scientist, where do we find the most spectacular evidence for the supernatural, superintelligent design uh, for the benefit of human life, I would say would be the quantities of the three different kinds of darkness. And just to give you an idea, uh, you have to fine tune the dark energy quantity to better than one part in 10 to the 122nd power in order for light to be possible in this universe. That degree of fine tuning it exceeds the very best example of human engineering design achievement by a factor of 100 trillion 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 times. Which means that the one that created this universe of matter, energy, space, and time must be at least that many times more intelligent than we are, at least that many times more knowledgeable than we are, at least that many times better funded than we are, <laughs> more powerful. Meet Dr. Hugh Ross physically here. He actually, that was on tape, he is physically here today, folks. Uh, Dr. Ross, uh, together with Dr. Gerald Schroeder, received the Idell P. Pot Totter, a prize presented by Texas A&M University in recognition of his work in demonstrating connections between science and religion. Hugh teaches as an adjunct Junked a faculty member at both A.W. Tozer Seminary. I'm from the Chicago area. All right. Nice guy, nice church. And Southern Evangelical Seminary. He also serves as Minister of Apologetics at uh, Sierra Madre Congregational Church, uh, where he conducts a weekly apologetics class. Hugh lives in Southern California, you lucky guy, with his wife Kathy and two sons. What an honor. What an honor to have you. And the guy that I wanted to surprise you with sits right next to me. This is Justin Bailey. And this guy, he watches on DVD, reads his books, among many others. <laughs> We've often said, it's amazing, he literally studies. Now this is, at least it seems this way with Sharon and myself, 24-7. I mean, I've never seen anybody that is constantly studying, and he does something so much greater than his grandfather. Dr. Hugh Ross, when he reads something, he actually remembers it. Wow. <laughs> so so I, have, I haven't got to there yet. Sometimes, some yeah. yeah, right. But it is so good to have you, Justin. Yeah. Dr. Hugh, and I wanted him to be on here because he's leaving for Baylor University, and I thought, what a treat. This is, this is uh, a blessing that you're in town at the very time that he's about to leave for Baylor University. Do you remember when you, in fact, let, let me just bring this up. Was it at 16 years of age you lectured at a university? Yes. No, it was a public lecture. It wasn't a lecture in a classroom to, to students as but part I of a course. I mean, 16? Well, I was studying astronomy from the age of seven forwards. And starting at age 15, I began a research project on uh, the, you know, the physics of newborn stars. 
and I wound up giving a lecture at the University of British Columbia to the uh, astronomy club there, and a lot of uh, students uh, from different uh, physics classes showed up. So, so you were one of those exceptional students. Uh, well, my parents say I was born a scientist. I was doing experiments from the time I was Seriously? two. So um, it, it was just something I really enjoyed. And uh, you know, I had to find answers to questions. I mean, at age seven, uh, I asked my parents, are the stars hot? And they said, yes, they are. I said, why are they hot? They said, go to the library. And uh, they showed me how to go. I went to the library all by myself at age seven into downtown Vancouver. Unbelievable. Came sounds home sounds, with five sounds like something Justin would do. So every weekend I would have five books on physics and astronomy from the, uh, from the library there. And, and I knew from the age of eight onwards that my career would be in astrophysics. Okay, now, <laughs> how did you break into something like that and find a university that you wanted to uh, arrive at? I mean, how, how does all that go together? Well. I was raised in Vancouver, and at that time... Which I love, by the way. Oh, yeah, I loved it, too. Yeah. Uh, but the only university was the University of British Columbia in the province. And so I went to that university. Good academically? Very good academically. They had an outstanding physics department, so I got a degree in physics. And then they encouraged me to go to the University of Toronto for degrees in astronomy, which I did, and then it went on to Caltech. Now, you got to tell me about the guy that come in with a box of Bibles and set them down. Yeah. What happened? Well, I mean, I didn't really get to know Christians until I was 27. 27? Well, they're, they're hard that's, to that's find age, in Canada. Right? 28, pretty close. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was 11 years of age, and these two businessmen came into a public school and put two boxes on our teacher's desk, and in those boxes were Gideon Bibles. And so we each took one. And uh, mine remained untouched, unread for six years. It wasn't until my studies in astronomy demonstrated that the universe had a beginning and therefore a beginner that I said, I'm going to see if I can find this God. And in one of the world's holy books, looked at the other holy books, finally picked up a Gideon Bible and realized this one had taught all the fundamentals of Big Bang cosmology thousands of years before any science had even dreamed of the concept. I mean, it talks about an expanding universe, talks about the universe having a space-time beginning how the laws that govern the heavens and the earth don't change from the creation event forward, how it's dominated by a law of decay. And I said, well, here's the Bible telling us we live in a Big Bang universe where the universe gets colder and colder as it gets older and older, and realized, you know, no scientist even thought about it, even hinted at the idea that the universe continuously expands until the 20th century. And yet you've got six different Bible authors in the Old Testament saying, we live in an expanding universe, starting with Job. What was your church background? Well, my parents took us to uh, a church a few times, um, and, uh, but there was problems in that church. My parents left, we never went back. Um, and you know, when I finally became convinced that there was a God, I signed my name in the back of a Gideon Bible and giving my life to Christ at age 19. I said, you know, I need to find Christians and began to go to different Canadian churches, but not knowing how to find a good church. Every church I tried uh, was either the pastor and the people didn't believe the Bible was the Word of God. And I remember getting so frustrated, I looked at the Toronto Star, the religion page, and they had like three pages of ads. So I need to find a church where people are passionate about the Word of God. So I circled several of them and went to them. <laughs> oh Every one of them was a cult. Are you serious? Wow. Yes. So uh, now, now I know how to find the good churches in Canada. <laughs> Goodness. So it wasn't really until I got to Caltech that I met Christians in the astronomy faculty there. A number of the world's most famous astronomers were Christians, and they were the ones that showed me how to Say find the church. Say that again. Astronomers were Christians? A lot, I found a lot of Christians in the Caltech astronomy research group. Now uh, you give over, what, over 300 uh, uh, universities you debate? I've spoken to over 300 okay. university what, campuses. What is that setting like? I mean, are, like you're on a platform and you, you've got <clears throat> atheists asking you questions or believers asking you questions or students that don't believe the Bible even uh, has any validity. That's predominantly what, what we see. Yeah. But uh, a lot of faculty and students uh, we see come to Christ through those events. Because typically we're talking to university people 
who have never heard a scientific defense of the Christian faith that has any credibility. And once they hear that, they say, how come we didn't know about this? And uh, they respond. Wow. I mean, we've even seen a Nobel laureate come to Christ uh, through uh, hearing our messages I and reading our books. Really? Yes. I'm going to give my <laughs> grandson the shot at the first in-depth question because oh, he's got him. No, I, I, I find it, you know, fascinating. Could you explain a little bit more what you actually think about Genesis 1 as far as the days and how you read, when you came to that text as a young man and you read that text, you, you read it and saw something in it that maybe some people hadn't seen before. How did you read that text? Well, I remember at age 17 picking up Genesis, looking at it and saying, the scientific method, it jumped off the page. Now, I'd been taught the scientific method in Canadian public schools in grade one, grade two, we got it every year. But none of our teachers told us where it came from. I looked at Genesis 1 and said, this is actually following what we call the scientific method. And I did some background study and recognized that the scientific method has its origin in scripture. And it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. You know, people who had a scientific bent were reading the Bible for themselves. They saw the command, uh, everything must be tested. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything, hold fast to that which is good. And then you actually see in the different creation texts in the Bible how to put everything to the test. For example, step one of what we call the scientific method is don't interpret until you establish the point of view. And what you see in Genesis 1, the first verse, the point of view is the universe as a whole. But in Genesis 1, 2, it changes the point of view to the surface of the waters of planet Earth. That's the perspective from which we're to understand the six days. Now, when I came to the U.S., what I realized is lots of people think Genesis 1 is teaching nonsense. But it's because they think the point of view for the six days is above the atmosphere of the Earth, not below the atmosphere on the waters. You get the wrong point of view, yes, it's teaching scientific now, nonsense. Can you give an example of why it would be scientific nonsense if their point of view was above the earth instead of from the surface of the earth? Creation day one and creation day four is where you run into really big problems because creation one, day one, let there be light. Okay, is that when God first creates cosmic light or is that when light that God created in the beginning first appears on the surface of the waters of planet earth? Now, recognizing the point of view as the surface of the earth, it says this text is speaking about God transforming the atmosphere from opaque to translucent. So earth begins with an opaque atmosphere. God transforms it to be translucent. Now the light of the sun, moon, and stars can make it through the surface of the earth, and photosynthesis is now possible. Now, that's implied in Genesis 1. It's explicit in Job 38. Job 37 through 39 also takes you through the six days of creation. And with reference to creation day one, the events before day one, you see in verses uh, eight and nine that God had blanketed the seas, referring to the primordial waters, with clouds that kept the seas dark. So there in Job it's explicit why it's dark on the surface of the waters. It's dark because of the clouds and then the atmosphere transforms. And what happens in day four, where it says, let there be the great lights, mm -hmm. this is when the atmosphere goes from translucent to an occasion transparent. Right. So if the creatures on the surface of the earth for the first time can see what lies above the clouds. And notice the text says, let there be in both cases. It doesn't say God created the light or made the light. It says, let the light be. And so having the right point of view transforms your understanding of the text in a very dramatic way. Galileo put it this way, the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. Wow. That's simply step one of the scientific method. Right. Then you go to step two, three, four, five, six, but it's all laid out there in Genesis 1. Now do you one. think if you, if you hadn't had your upbringing studying astronomy and cosmology and getting to that age where you look at Genesis 1, you look at the other holy books and, and the creation myths that come along with, with those religions, and then you look at Christianity and you read Genesis 1, do you think that because you were convinced 
of Big Bang cosmology. Did that at all affect the way that you read that text? Do you think that that, that had a role in your understanding? Well, it did in this sense. I mean, I remember looking at the Hindu Vedas and, and the Buddhist commentaries, and there they speak about God or God's creating within space and time that eternally exists. You get that in Immanuel Kant's writings as well. And I said, hey, we got space-time theorems that tell us that space and time don't exist until the universe comes into existence. The Bible was the one holy book that got that part right, where it says God creates outside of space and time, not within space and time. So that was a huge aha moment mm -hmm. when I first picked up the Bible, uh, whereas the other books had the space-time concepts wrong, it got it right. And then I kind of continued to read through. Uh, you know, the first time I picked up uh, the Bible for a serious read, it took me four hours to get out of Genesis 1 because I was checking out every little detail that was there. Mm -hmm. By the end of those four hours, I said, it's got everything correctly stated and in the correct chronological order. And the only way I can understand that is if Moses was actually inspired by the one that created the universe and created all life here on planet Earth. So that was my first clue. This book is not like the other holy books. This is a book that's actually inspired by the one that did it all. So we hear a lot of, uh, you know, the Quran inspired and other books, you know, the Book of Mormon inspired and so forth. Did you ever have a problem with believing that the Bible was inspired and errant? Well, my approach to the holy books was I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to try to read them in the best possible light. But if I find a provable error or contradiction, then I know it's not from God. Because a God that created the universe is a God that obviously enjoys harmony, elegance, beauty, and truth. And so I was looking for the opposite. I spent 18 months fine tooth combing the Bible. I was studying at a minimum of an hour a day for a period of 18 months, trying to find a provable error or contradiction. What were you looking for? Well. Looking for things like you see in the Quran. I mean, in the Quran, for example, it says the gestation period of the woman is six months. I said, well, this must have been written by a man, not by a woman, because we know it's nine months, not six months. Uh, or where they uh, imply that the stars are closer to us than the planets. I said, we know that's not correct. And so, uh, and likewise, when I picked up the Mormon scriptures, realizing what it said about the center of our galaxy was provably false but I couldn't find anything in the Bible that was provably false. Now, I, to be honest, I found many passages of the Bible I didn't understand, but I couldn't find a single provable error or contradiction. So you, okay, you just answered my question. I was gonna say, did you find contradictions? I didn't. Um, <clears throat> now, the atheist put out a book called 139 Contradictions in the Bible. Almost all of those contradictions are a failure to understand significant figures you know, where one Bible author will round it off and say the Jews were wandering the wilderness for 400 years, where another one will say 440 years. Well, one is rounding it off to one place, and then one's rounding it off to two. The real number might be 438. So I don't, I don't recognize that as a contradiction. Wow. Uh, now, what really impressed me, though, as I went through the Bible, not only did I find no contradictions, I found hundreds of places where the Bible predicted future scientific discoveries. And I actually calculated the age of 19. What is the probability that these Bible authors could actually predict these future scientific discoveries without being divinely inspired? And very conservatively, I calculated the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 300. And that told me the Bible is more reliable than our laws of physics because you know, the second law of thermodynamics has got one chance in 10 to the 80th of failing. So I said, this is a book that's actually more reliable uh, than our thermodynamic laws. And since I trust those laws, it only makes sense that I give even more confidence and trust in the message that's in this book. And that's when I signed my name in the back of the Bible, giving my life to Christ. Now, how do you deal with people that say, look, Jesus Christ came to die on a cross, shed his blood, go to the grave, and the third day rise so that we would believe, trust him by faith, and be accepted someday as his children, 
rapture or mm -hmm. whichever one you want to pick, death or rapture or however. And that's the, the whole of the Word of God. Why do we need all of this scientific, old earth, <clears throat> young earth, all of the things you were just talking about? Why is that necessary? Well, if you go through the Bible, you'll find over two dozen chapter length or longer texts on the subject of creation. And what I find fascinating, each one of them links creation theology with redemption. That should tell us that creation is really important. And what really impresses me is you've got passages in the Bible that tell us redemption came before creation. You've got uh, one, 2 Timothy 1.9, the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. So before God created any component of this physical universe, he was already putting into effect his work of redemption. So if we can really understand creation in the way that the Bible wants us to understand it, we'll have a much better grasp of redemption. And so just simply recognizing that's why God created. And so, uh, and the Bible, if you go through these creation texts, it tells us God gave us two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture, and commands those of us who are believers to use the book of nature to bring people to the book of scripture. Or to take your example, <coughs> you know, I would agree that the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a very compelling apologetic tool. I mean, one of the most powerful arguments you can give. The problem is your typical American non-Christian doesn't want to listen to something that happened 2,000 years ago. You know, we have founded Reasons to Believe. The organization I founded 28 years ago is that it's easier to engage people on something that was discovered 48 hours ago. Do you realize what scientists have found and how this new discovery makes a strong case for the God of the Bible? Then we can use that new piece of evidence as a link to the traditional evidences. So we do it reasons to believe, is that we research and proclaim these new reasons to believe as a tool to bring people to the old reasons to believe and thereby bring them to faith in Christ. Now you have believers uh, that challenge you. Sure. Uh, and I've seen some of them. <laughs> I've seen some of them on, on some DVDs. Uh, how do you interpret their approach, which is entirely different than yours? Well, what we've developed as reasons to believe is a creation model approach. In other words, we're saying, you know, here's our interpretation of the Bible, here's our interpretation of the book of nature, and uh, we contrast our interpretation with other competing models, the atheistic model, the deistic model, the theistic evolution model, the young earth model, I mean, all kinds of these competing models. And we say, now, if our model has more comprehensive explanation of what we see in the Bible and nature, then probably we're on the right tack. And moreover, what we do is we make predictions. So if you look at our books, we're always making predictions of what theologians and scientists will discover in the future. And our point is, if our predictions more successfully come true than, say, the atheist predictions, then maybe you need to take the truth claims of Jesus Christ in the Bible seriously. But if our model fails, then maybe we're wrong. And so what we do at Reasons to Believe is we take risks. We basically say, now, if you can prove that the universe did not have a beginning, that's catastrophic to the Christian faith. Or if you can prove that human beings are no different than the rest of the animals, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. Now, my friend, uh, I say, if you're not a believer, where are some things that would be catastrophic to your worldview? And we put it in a positive sense. You know, if we make these discoveries that really demonstrate that the entire human species is descended from one man and one woman that lived in one place in recent times, then that's a check for the Christian faith. But if we were to prove that, uh, you know, we humans are no different than the animals, we're not spiritual beings at all, uh, that would be uh, a mark for the atheistic worldview. And that's how we engage people who disagree with us. We say, okay, you present your model, we'll present our model, and let's put it to the test. That's what the Bible commands us to do, test everything. But it's not enough to test it. You also have to hold fast to that which proves to be good. 
because a lot of people I run into are cynics. They'll actually believe our model, but they won't act on what they know to be true. We have three minutes. Do you have a question? <laughs> oh, I'm uh, sure a number of questions. Um, One that he can answer, maybe shortly. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm, shortly. At this point, where you're at in your, in your study of your model and developing your model, has there ever been a moment to where you think another model may be heading in a direction that's, that's better than yours, or do you always feel that your model has retained the best position all the time? Well, what we have at Reasons to Believe is a family of closely related models. I mean, the rest of the scientists and theologians on our staff uh, will take slightly different positions than I do. Uh, so we have what's called the general model, and then we've got more specific models underneath it. Recognizing we don't have the complete picture yet, but we've been doing this for 28 years now, and we're realizing is, you know, we had anomalies in our model 28 years ago. The anomalies we have today are a lot smaller, a lot less significant than they were before. But if we're doing our model research right, every time we resolve a model or resolve an anomaly in favor of our model, that should reveal three or four more anomalies we didn't even know were there. Explain an anomaly. Anomaly is something that doesn't quite fit the model that you have. I mean, it's, it's a discrepancy. Something doesn't quite work. And so, so you're you, trying to find something that would disprove? Exactly. Okay. And then you research that and you say, uh, you know, maybe we got the measurements wrong. Uh, maybe the assumption behind it was wrong. And so you kind of research it and the anomaly gets removed. That's good for your model. If the anomaly gets bigger, then you better adjust your model. Maybe you need to throw out your model. Have you ever had to do that? We've had to make adjustments, yes. Uh, I mean, we had a model for the moon uh, 30 years ago that we've had to adjust but it's actually made our model stronger and more comprehensive in its explanation. Wow. We have a part two. All of these books can be received if you go to that website and everything that Dr. Hugh Ross has done, there's the book we're talking about today, you can order if you go to that website. And all of the DVDs, by the way, this DVD right here, you have got to get this as well as the book, okay? Go to that website. This will absolutely amaze you. I'm going to show you a clip on part two from this also, but uh, we're going to go into what does the universe tell us uh, about darkness? Uh, some of the things that Dr. Hugh Ross says, are, and, and is this an old earth or young earth? We're going to get into that. We're going to talk about things that I am just sure that you have not heard on Christian television. We'll be back part two. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.